Autumn has to be every carp angler's favourite time of year to go carp fishing. The fish are at their best weights and they're looking amazing, but it is not easy. They've been pressured all summer long and tactics have to be spot on to keep getting bites. I'm down in southern Germany with Daryl Peck. We're at a fantastic water, but it is very pressured, so it's typical of loads of venues all the way across Europe. This is the Autumn Masterclass. There we go. <laughs> yeah, man, look at that. There we go. So that is the second spot located and to get to this point it has taken a long time. Um, this is a completely new venue for me. We had no map of the lake bed or anything else. And what I've basically done is just investigated the areas where I saw fish showing when we got here yesterday evening, the light was dropping. It was getting cooler and cooler, but the fish were showing. And um, they were showing out there at that sort of area and just beyond it, just sort of out in no man's land, really. Um, the only prominent feature on the lake is off to the left, there's a very shallow bar there with lilies on top of it. And if it was summer, then maybe I would be investigating that area and looking to fish right up under the trees on the far bank. But at this time of the year, you know, I think you want to be out in open water more. You know, th there's a little bar there, a little tiny bit of gravel. It's not really any shallower. Maybe it's just a sort of gravel area, um, but it's different from everything else that's out there and it's in the zone where the fish were showing. So I've repeatedly cast out there beyond that distance, pulled it back and it's just smooth, smooth, smooth. And then you just get the first few taps of gravel. That's where you want to be fishing, just on the back of the feature, just where it goes from, from the soft stuff into the gravel. And there, I bet there's probably still, I don't know, 10 mil of soft stuff on top of that gravel. It's probably not exposed at that point. If I pull it back further, it probably appears and rather than fishing right in the centre of the obvious bit, I'm just on the back of it. Um, so it's well worth investigating the swim at the start. If this was a syndicate and I was fishing it all the time, I'd have that written down in my phone already and I'd go straight out onto the marks with no messing about. But on a new lake that you've never been to before, you do need to spend some time. You don't want to be doing it when the fish are showing. You know, so we've waited until the next day and uh, there's no fish showing. It's the middle of the day now, probably not a good time to get a bite. So it's worth really investigating the area. I've got the marker braid on there with 30 pound armor cord. I started off with just a lead on the end and then I've moved over to the float. And um, by, by casting repeatedly and letting the float up repeatedly, I know that there's, there's a little bit of difference in depth, maybe a foot, it comes up a little bit onto that gravel area. Um, but I really know that swim I've cast left and right of it. The gravel doesn't go very far left and right. So a little patch of gravel like that amongst a load of soft stuff where the fish have been showing is definitely the area to start. And the other area sort of over my shoulder behind me, down in that bottom corner, you're not allowed to fish. There's loads of trees down there in the water. Jürgen walked around me yesterday and explained the bits you can and can't fish. And really that's the only really snaggy area that's out of bounds on the whole lake. And there were fish showing there the whole time, you know? So, so I've got as close to that as I possibly can. There's a sign down there that says no fishing beyond this point. So I've gone right up to the edge of that. Again, cast repeatedly, just with the marker lead on the end, no float at all. So you feel more and it's lovely and hard out there sort of probably two rod lengths off the bank, something like that. And I've cast a little bit further off the bank as well. The aim is to fish two rods down there to start off with. I'm gonna bait this area as well, um, but I've baited down there pretty heavy. So once I've had quite a few casts, I've gone down and had a look, seen where the float is, made sure I'm not taking the mick and um, left the float up and then gone down there and basically used the spoon and used the catapult and spread bait all over that area. There's a lot of carp in here, three to 400 fish. The average is probably upper 20, maybe into 30 pounds, and they go up to over 60 pounds in here. So there's a lot of big fish in here. At this time of the year, you can get away with a fair bit of bait. Now, at this time of the year in England, when loads of people have put bait in all summer and the fish are pretty full, I probably wouldn't use that much. But on a lake like this, where there's not that many anglers fishing here, it's not full every single day of the week, 
and there's a lot of big fish, I think they're going to get through the bait. So I've started off with three or four kilos, 15 millers and 18 millers, and I've spread them all over the area in a great big area that's basically not one spot. You know, I've not all just catapulted it on top of the float time and time and time again. Some of it's hit the trees as I've thrown it and it's dropped a bit short. Some of it's gone a bit far. You know, I put a few pouch loads of tigers out as well. And there's a big area there that's probably 20 yards deep and at least 10 yards wide. And then after I've done that, I've gone further down the bank and I've catapulted just a few boilies through the trees on the way down to that corner where you can't fish. So you imagine the fish are down in that corner, they're happy in there, there's loads of woodwork sticking out the bottom, they can't be fished for, you know, and they'll sit down there for long periods. But if you put baits into that zone, they eat one, they eat another one, they like the taste of them, hopefully I'm going to draw those fish out of that zone, they'll get to the area where there's more and more bait, they'll start eating more and more bait, and then boom, I'm going to get bite. So, that's the way I'm going to fish down there. I'm going to try and draw the fish out of that area. Um, I'm going to fish it probably in the day more than I am the night time. I'm going to move out onto this spot for the night. So I've got two areas going. So I think it's time to get some bait in with this one now. Traditional spawning. I could go out in the boat and put it all out with the boat. And maybe later in the week I will do that. But for now, I think there's a real advantage to fishing from the bank rather than going out in the boat and going round and round and round. It's not a massive lake. I'm sure the fish know all about the boats. And I think fishing from the bank at the start is a real advantage. <laughs> Lovely. I'm going to put about 15 large bombs out over this area and I'm going to spread them out. I don't want them all dropping on a dustbin lid. These are big fish and um, I want to give them a little bit of room. So I started off by putting the spoms out at the same range as the fishing rod is clipped up at. So 14 and a half wraps and they were fall, uh, they're falling well past the spot. Um, so I'm baiting up at the back of the area with those. You know, and anybody that's in deep water like this, this is 22 foot deep. Anyone that's spotting the same range as their fishing rods is spotting behind their rigs. Because with the, the lead falling through the water against the clip, it's coming towards you the whole time. And uh, lovely. Um, and obviously the spot is not falling through the water, so it's not coming towards you. So by clipping up at the same range, you drop a little bit of bait behind it. And I've done sort of half a dozen spoms behind the area. And then the rest of it's gonna go on it. So about 10 or 12 spoms on it. I'm also gonna catapult a few baits out over the top of it as well, because it's catapult range um, with these 18 millers, just to spread it out a little bit, you know. Um, got no idea really um, how many bites I'm going to get in this situation at the moment. Um, so, not, it's not like I'm particle fishing for double figure fish. You know, I'm boily fishing for, for 30s and 40s, maybe even 50s. So, uh, big spawn to start off with. I'll swap over to a medium spawn once I start getting bites. And I still don't know at the moment whether I'm going to fish this spot tonight or not. I may just have two rods down the margin there on that other area. The bait mix is the same, some cell, some link. Both have been soaked in the smart liquid, which is absolutely brilliant. Um, and a few tigers in there as well. More to fill little gaps up in the spod, or the large spom, sorry, than anything else. Um, and just having a couple of different food items out there, I think is no bad thing. I don't really want to fish with tigers unless I have to. Much rather be catching them on boilies. And I think that's how I'm going to snare the bigger ones at this time of the year. But um, as you saw when we fished in Germany in the summer masterclass, I was putting out maize and boilies together. Here there's a few bream, so I'm avoiding the maize and just going straight onto tigers. So by having two types of food out there and two types of boilie, I've got vegetable food, I've got boilie, and uh, the boilie split into link and cell, I'm really hedging my bets. That buffet theory that Ali talks a lot about, you know, hopefully everything out there is going to like something that I'm putting out. And uh, we start with this, see how we go. Um, and I'm sure it will evolve during the week. Um, and there'll be one particular thing they like more than others. 
But for now, that is the opening gambit. I decided to go with plan A, leave the open water area to develop and fish both rods close to where I'd seen the bulk of the shows. A whole night and morning with bait and no lines in that open water spot can only build the fish's confidence in feeding there and two rods close to the out of bounds effectively doubles the chances of that all important first bite. I've got higher tracks on both rods, 15mm isotonic wafter on one and an 18mm garlic wafter on the other. Um, they were both part of the high impact range when they started off and uh, I've just flooded them with goo. Normally when I start a session I'll fish higher tracks, see what happens and then hopefully as the week goes on move over to more match the hatch hook baits in the hope of snaring bigger fish. But for now, it's a new lake, first night, you know, you need a couple of bites under your belt and then you can start to relax and uh, start looking for a bigger fish. Both rigs are exactly the same. They're both combis, so 25 pound boom, about five inches long with a loop on the end of it. It's loop to loop on uh, with one of those size four claws, very, very sharp, really in turn point, heavily in turned eye, so it turns in your hand really aggressively. Quite a short hair on those as well and I've tied those loops with 30 pound armor cord so it all goes out straight. And fish running, it's on a lead clip, just about 12, 14 inches of tubing just to stop tangles. And then I'm squeezing the eye of the swivel that goes inside the lead clip so it only just nicks in there under the lightest pressure. If the fish picks it up and shakes its head, it's gonna keep sliding away from the fish and there's no anchor point for them to get rid of it. So it's what I use when the bottom's clean like it is out here and there's no snags around. I don't think they start until you go right down into the corner. Um, that's what I'll start with. Three and a half ounce flat pair legs, just in case there was, is any slope out there off that marginal shelf. And uh, we'll see what develops. Even though I knew the fish wasn't a monster, I played it like it was. They say the hardest one to catch on any new water is the first one, and with it so close to netting, I didn't want to make any stupid mistakes. Yeah man, always good to get your first one from a new lake. I've gone through several changes already. I had an aborted take at midnight and I'm fishing running lead clips with a long tag end on the knot to the swivel. And that tag end was pushed out of the lead clip, which means something's happened at the rig end. Um, a fish has not hooked itself, pulled it around, and um, that tag end was pushed out when I wound it back in again. So I've tightened the lines up. Um, so the fish hooks itself as much against the tight line and the rod as it does against the lead. And um, that resulted in a take three hours later, about half three this morning. Rip roaring take, even though it was screwed up tight. And um, it took line, took line as I picked the rod up and cut me off. So uh, I was gutted about that, but obviously I've learned now that uh, you cannot give them any line. So I've screwed both rods up tight. Redid this rod as well. Both the bites had come on a garlic wafter. The other rod had isotonic on it and that hadn't done anything. So I've put garlic on both rods. This one was changed over and has produced the bite. Just under 21 pound. Absolutely chuffed a bit. The recast of that rod went out perfectly and I went down and put a little bit of bait in before I cast out. I think it's always better to scare the fish away with bait than with a rig falling amongst them. You imagine all up-ended feeding and three and a half ounces of lead crashes in amongst them. They might go and never come back. So I went down there. Fortunately, I can throw baits in on the near rod and I just catapult a few on the further rod and spread them all around the area so the fish are moving quite fast between baits. I think that makes them easier to hook as well. And I'm just replacing the bait that I think's been eaten and just at the same time scaring the fish away so I can get that rig out. A little while ago, I've chosen to put back leads on. 
And the reason for that is I think the line is the scariest thing in fishing. So if you can pin it to the deck with a back lead, then hopefully the fish will come back into the area and you may get a bonus bite during the day. So I'm just putting quarter of an ounce ones on, really, really light ones, clip them on, slide them out as far as you can, then open the bail arm, let them drop as straight as possible. So with them being out that distance, there's less of an angle in the line. So when you do get a take, the fish can't move very far until it hits that solid clutch. So I do that in the daytime when I can be on the rod straight away. At night, I probably won't, because I want to get a little bit more indication and I don't want the fish to move at all at night. I'm also tonight going to move that right hand rod out to the other spot that I've baited up. I put about 15 spawns out yesterday and the important thing is it started slicking this morning. I had a couple of fish crash near it in the dark but not right on it but this morning there was definitely a slick coming up and that's the smart liquid on the baits. It's sort of a fat source so when the fish are chewing the baits a little bit of fat is coming up to the surface because it floats that's causing a bit of a slick, so I know the fish are eating it. And I think, where I'm fishing two rods down the margin, I don't think I'm gonna really get any more bites than I would do with one rod. Because it's not a big open water area where fish can approach from loads of directions, I think each time you get a bite, you spook the fish away that are already out there, go down, put a bit more bait in, recast it, and then I think having two rods on the spot is gonna get you no quicker bite than having one. So if I've got rods on two different spots, I could potentially get several bites during the night rather than just one or two. So that's the game plan for now. We'll see how it develops. And as we learn more about the lake, we will hone our approach to get more and more bites. No idea how big this is. Not really been in touch with it at all, really. Get that net. Number two. Yeah, he's got you. Lovely. Oh, I've got those shoes on. And this one absolutely roared off. Feels a bit heavier than the last one. That's two on the right hand area. So, baiting it last night and not fishing it. Definitely an advantage, but it's much warmer tonight. And the fish are showing a lot more all over the lake. I'm going to put two rods out on this other area now. Come on this time. Gotcha! Yes! Right. New rig. More bait. Both rods on that spot. Make the most of it while it's happening. I was away again on the same rod out in open water and I instantly knew it was a better fish. It felt heavy and powerful from the word go, and as it surfaced close to the net, I could see it was a much bigger common. Get in that net. Yes, get in. That is a 30 pounder all day long. Yeah man, look at that, 27-12, the first one of last night's trio and uh, moving out to that spot in the centre of the lake has definitely, definitely paid dividends and it's nice to be getting them out in open water. Still the same setup, combi rig with one of those 18 mil garlic infused wafter hook baits, loads of bait over the top of it and there was loads of bait in the sling, that's really, really important. You're getting them out in the morning, um, see what's in the sling. There was loads of link in there, so he's obviously taking a preference to that. It's really good to know, and there'll be a lot more bait going out on that spot later on today. Come on, big fella. Yeah, that's a bit more like it. 39 pounds, 12 ounces. Biggest of the trio. I had a 20 pounder, nice scaly male in between these two commons and uh, it shows that the spot is rocking now. All three bites off the right hand spot and uh, I think putting the bait out 24 hours before and then rebaiting it again before I put the rods out um, is doing the trick. Still one of the garlic wafters. Um, this one on another different rig. Uh, this is straight through 25 pound boom. 
um, onto a spinner swivel, size two curve, um, and one of those D-rig kickers, which um, I absolutely love. And uh, it was nailed beyond belief. So that is definitely, definitely going back out there tonight. Interestingly, the sling had loads of tigers in it and um, a little bit of bait as well, a little bit of boilie, but it shows this one does like tigers. So by having a mix of baits, if, as long as they're eating something and the hook bait, that's all that matters. Awfully long drive down here yesterday, all the way from the UK, 12 hours in the car total. Um, yeah, absolutely knackered. Arrived just on the cusp of dark, um, met Dan in the first swim by the gate, and immediately, you know, on the cusp of dark, there was lots of fish showing, you know, in his area and elsewhere in the lake as well. There's another swim opposite him, which is a bit close to be fair. It's just felt like it was straight on top of him. And then that leaves three other swims. So there's five swims in total. Um, there's one right at the far end of the lake. It's sort of not seen anything there. It doesn't really look like a good bet. Um, there's another swim at that end that's fishes to the far bank. Dan's um, already baited that so as, a, as a second swim for himself. And that leaves me this one here. So uh, I think it's swim number four. It's central um, and being in the middle is never a bad option really. I've heard some fish um, on the far bank. There's a, a tree line opposite and there's been a few fish shown over there in the night. One this morning um, and the odd one sort of in open water. So there's some fish here, certainly not on the, on the, on the pack as such, but there's enough fish in here for me to hope that I can catch a few. So the far bank from my swim in a straight line is 120 yards. And obviously as you go on a bit of an angle, that distance increases a little bit. I could, opening gambit, fire the marker rod over there quite a few times, find a nice spot, you know. But, you know, we're allowed to use rowing boats on this lake. And for the amount of cast that I would need to make to get a, an idea in my head of what it was like over there, I, I might as well just go over there in the boat and have a look. You know, the water's clear enough to see the bottom in probably two metres or more. So uh, I think it, a good idea, pump the uh, inflatable up, go over, have a little look, dump and run, you know, while I'm there. If I see something that I like, the bottom looks good, I'll just lower the bait down, handful the bait over the top and come back to the swim. The rigs are evolving as the session goes on. I've got stiff hook links on both rods now. And the reason for that is I'd had two on the right hand area last night, it was about midnight. And um, I felt like I should have caught one on the left hand area. So I wound it in to put it on the right hand area thinking there's no fish on the left and it was tangled. And that was a 25 pound boom hook link with a soft bit at the end, a loop to loop, 30 pound armor called section that I've cast countless times had no problems with it whatsoever. When I was fishing Gigantica this year with two grains of corn, whacking it out 28 wraps, never had a single tangle. So I think it's the weight of the bait because I've got an 18 mil boily and a little pop up on there. Maybe that's causing the issue. So I've gone over to a stiff hook link straight through on that rod. That's hybrid stiff with no loop at the end. So basically it's just crimped straight onto one of those new PTFE spinner swivels. There's no ring on the end of that. I've cut that off. Um, and I've used that rig to good effect at Gigantica this summer. And I just wanted something that just had nothing in it that could wrap around. Put that rod out on the spot where I've been catching the fish from and the other rod went again, which is also a stiff hook link. That's 25 pound boom straight through. And um, about three hours later, I had a bream on that rod on the stiff straight through the hybrid stiff. And it was absolutely nailed. So the rig is obviously working. It doesn't need to have a hinge at the hook end. Um, and then the other rod dropped back and that was a bream bite as well. So I took both rods off of that spot, put one down the left hand margin, rebaited the right hand spot really heavily and then put the stiff hook ring back out there again. Nothing happened on that, but this morning about 10 o'clock out of the blue, I had a bite on the left hand rod. And uh, unfortunately we didn't get any pictures of it. It got away from us in the sling, um, but I weighed him up. He was 29 pound, a common, really nice fish and um, it was absolutely nailed on that stiff hook link straight through. So I'm gonna get no tangle problems with it. It's obviously a very, very efficient rig. That PTFE coated swivel makes the hook turn even faster. I'm using one of the claw hooks 
one of those garlic wafters. I'm drilling them out a little bit. So much garlic has got into them, but actually now they sink very, very slowly. So I've drilled them out, put a little bit of cork in them, just to hold them just above the hook. So the hook's laying flat on the bottom, the bait's just hovering above. I've done exactly the same baiting system as I did last night. So I've put about two kilos down the left-hand margin. That's a mixture of 15 and 18 mil link covered in that smart liquid, which I really rate. You know, that's something we've not talked a lot about yet. It seems to really draw the fish in. It's a fat sauce, it goes up through the water column and it goes down around all of the baits. Everywhere I've used it, in every country, every venue, just feels like you're getting more bites. So that's all over the link. It's all over the cell as well. There's a specified one for the cell. And I've mixed both baits, both sizes and tigers as well. I put two kilos down the left-hand margin and spread it a long way. This is really important. The fish are down in that corner. They're showing in that corner. As it gets to this sort of time of day, they start showing. It's all woodwork down there. You can't fish there. So the fish are just living there. So I'm putting a lot of bait in. Over one rod, probably two kilos of bait. I'm putting a lot over the top of the rod itself. I can walk down there, use the scoop and throw it in. But I'm throwing loads past it down towards that corner. So you imagine they come out of the corner, they find one, they find another one. They're no, in no particular order. They're all over the place. Oh, there's a tiger up there, there's 15 mil there, 18 mil there. That one's sell, that one's linked. By the time they've got up to the baited area, they are just eating them. They're loving them. You can see this morning, the fish were crapping the bait out. They're absolutely loving it. One fish had loads of tigers in the sling. The other one had loads of boilies in the sling. So if you've got a nice mix, you're covering every base. Then on the right hand rod, 15 spoms went out over the top of that one. Again, a very stiff hook link, boom straight through, but this one has got a hinge at the end. Still one of those PTF coated swivels, still one of the garlic hook baits. I'm really confident tonight I'm gonna to get bites off of both areas. They're both back led as well, just to keep the line away from the fish so they can come in and feed with confidence, not touch the line, and hopefully when it gets dark, the action's gonna start happening. So my opening gambit was to um take the boat across to the far side, have a little look into the edge and see if there was anything very obvious, you know, if there was some weed or some glowing clear spots, anything really, really sort of, oh my God, that's the one, you know, but to be fair, the water or the bottom tapers off really quickly and it's, you can't see the bottom, once you're more than the rod length and a half off the bank, you can't see the bottom. Um, it's, it's dropping away really, really fast. So I did see a fish sort of this morning towards a set of reeds on the far bank and I, um, I've, I've went over there, that was my first port of call, and I dropped a rig from the, from the boat. You know, it probably might be 130 yards, something like that from the swim. I don't know exactly, it's quite far. Um, and I've actually really, really hurt my right arm recently. And I'm, I did have a cast with uh, a bare lead on my mark rod just to see if I could reach. And before I'd even fully finished putting the power through the cast, it, yeah, the arm gave way and it was, it was really, really sore. So um, although I've got that one rod out there dropped from the boat, I'm hoping that the second rod, which is, um, I've cast that, I plumbed around um, being as careful as I can with my arm and I can just about reach. It's 26, 26 and a half rod lengths to the far side. I'm about two rod lengths short on, on the sort of the gravel shelf of, the, of that far margin. And uh, I've been over there in the boat after plumbing left the mark float out there, put a little bit of bait around it and uh, cast a hook bait on top of that. So at the moment, I've got two different sort of things going on. I've got a single, or I've got a rig drop from a boat um, with a few handfuls over it, and I've got one cast from the bank. And my hope is that the, um, the cast rod is the one that produces. And if that is the case, then I'll move both onto that spot bait up once a day, put the mark float over there, pop it to the surface, bait up once a day there, and then cast hook baits onto that. So I'm keeping the disturbance to an absolute minimum. You know, that's, that's what I'm hoping is gonna happen. But you never know, I'm either gonna blank or catch something. And hopefully, if, like I say, if I do catch something, it'll be on the left-hand rod, because then I can cast from the bank, keep the disturbance down. The only one from last night and uh, 24 and a half this one went came on the left hand rod 
down towards that snaggy area, again on a garlic wafter over a spread of all those different sizes of boilie and a little bit of uh, tiger nut as well. Expected more to be honest, the right hand area didn't spark up at all, I had one sort of funny funny sort of couple of bloops in the middle of the night, I redid the ride, put a bit more bait out and it just didn't occur and we saw fish out there yesterday as well, so it's quite disappointing in that respect. But um, I'm not going to sit around and wait all day, I'm going to move up the other end today. I prepped another spot up there a couple of days ago, had a check out of the area, close to the snags, put some bait out as well. Daryl reckons he's seen them showing down there yesterday morning, so rather than sitting around all day, I'm going to make the most of this really good weather for a daytime bite, see if we can catch another one. <laughs> So, big change up today. Nothing happened last night. Fishing over to the far bank, and lots of fish were showing in the open water. Not all in sort of one area, but over a, the majority of the lake. But just on dusk, one showed slightly out to the left. It was a good fish. Um, and it was like a straight up, straight back down sort of show, sort of what I would call a feeding show. And uh, I logged that. But other than that single show, a lot of the activity was out to the right and that was where I initially plumbed. So I spent 10 or 15 minutes plumbing out to the right of my swim. The bottom was just very samey, silty or muddy. Sometimes it was slightly easier than others, but nothing that really grabbed my attention. None of the drops were particularly special and it just didn't feel right. Um, so I panned around to the left and remembered where that single fish had shown and uh, cast out there several times with a bare lead and I started to pick up sort of very faint gravel, not, not a massive area but a faint area of gravel and uh, zoned in on it and adjusted the clip until I was landing on it every single time. Um, small spot, maybe, maybe six foot wide, maybe a little bit less, I'd probably say a little bit less than six foot wide, um, but enough room for two. So once I had it clipped up exactly, uh, it was 18 wraps and three to four feet, so we'll just call it 18 wraps and three feet. And uh, I cast out again on that clip, but this time with a marker float. So I cast out, felt it to the lead, uh, felt it to the bottom on that clip and let the marker float to the surface. It's 20 foot deep, exactly 20 foot. And I've gone out in the, in the boat and I've put what I would, I would guess is the equivalent to 20 large bombs of bait. So I would say no more than two kilo. It's a mixture of 15 mil cell and tiger nuts um, and they've got a little bit of smart liquid on and they, it left a massive slick sort of as I put it into the water and I think that that's in deep water that's a really good thing you know some some a real scent trail moving through the water column to help for, hopefully pull the fish in on the bait um, and I've decided for tonight to put both of my rods on that spot both of them fish with the same rig I've got a leg clip system on both with dark matter tubing and I've got a, a combi multi-rig on both of them and they're both fished with um, snowman rigs. You know, I've got a tiny eight mil cell topper on, a white cell topper on the top of a 15 mil and it, yeah, just kicks away from the lead, lovely, all, all good. So I'm happy with that spot, whether it produces or not, it remains to be seen, but I've got four nights left, including tonight. And I think it's, it's good to get a bit of bait in on a spot that you're happy with. And because the bottom is so much like a desert out there and there doesn't seem to be very much in the way of gravel or, or ups and downs as such in front of my swim, I think that one tiny patch of gravel is, is something in amongst nothing. And quite often that one show might have led me onto, onto the path of something, but we'll have to wait and see. I hung it out until it was almost dark, willing one of the rods to go, just as you would on any short day session. No bites came, so I rushed back to base camp to get the rods back out on the spots for the night. Darrell had honed his approach based on what he'd seen the previous evening, and that new spot did his first bite. First one. Oh yeah, 30 pound 12. Well there he is, carp number one. First one is always the hardest. And uh, it came from the, the new spot 
on the gravel patch and I had two rods out there, both on the same spot, probably four to five feet apart. And uh, over two kilos of bait, you know, a mixture of cell and tiger nuts, you'd think that you'd get more than one take. You know, I'm a little bit, a little bit surprised to only get one take. Did they come in and eat all the bait or was I just not presented right or did I not have the right hook bait on? So certainly a lot to, to take and uh, to move forward with. But for a minute, let's just admire a lovely 30 pound common and uh, appreciate it for what it is. So I've caught one, I've got a spot and that's, um, that's always the first concern, you know, finding a spot that the fish are willing to feed on. So now having caught one, I've decided to up the bait. You know, it's a bit of a risk, but um, I've gone in pretty heavy, maybe three kilos of boilies, maybe a kilo of tiger nuts, so four kilo total, um, which is quite a lot of bait considering we're nearly into November. You know, it's um, the water's getting colder, the fish are probably eating less, but there's a lot of big fish in this lake. We're not talking about 10, 20, 30, we're talking about several hundred um, and some real big ones. So I'm hoping to get them coming onto that spot. I'm trying to let them know that I'm there, you know, with that, with that amount of food, that amount of smart liquid all, all over it, soaked into it in the lake water, that should be really pumping through the water column. And um, my thinking is that over the course of the day, you know, they might not be feeding, but that smell, that vapor trail is, is working the water column. The fish are moving around, swimming about. I'm trying to let them know that it's there. And hopefully once it gets dark, they're gonna come in on that bait. So I've decided to change rigs. Um, I've gone in for spinner rigs with um, Bonoffi white pop-ups. Um, and the thinking behind that is I've put an awful lot of bait out, lots and lots of food items on the bottom and uh, it's dark the fish are going to be searching around the bottom and I do not want my hook bait to be one of the last ones to go you know what I want to happen by fishing an inch off the bottom is the fish to come in get on the bait come across the hook bait fairly quickly catch one and then have the opportunity to get the rig back out there as soon as possible to try and generate a markable fish situation. Rigs for autumn fishing shouldn't really change from what you're successful with in the summer, to be honest. Um, the fish's behaviour is not really changing. Um, and really, I fish the same rigs 12 months a year. Um, the rig is constructed to suit the spot it's landing on, and that's really, really important. In this situation, we've got nice, clean, firm bottom out there. There's gravel in places, um, uh, but the other bits, if there's not gravel, it's nice sort of firm clay. The lead's not burying in at all. You're getting a lovely solid donk. I mean, in that situation, you can fish pretty much any rig, but I've avoided fishing helicopter rigs in that situation, especially if you couple them with slack lines because I don't think they're very efficient at hooking the fish. Um, there's too much movement going on before the fish really feels any resistance. So. I've found running rigs to be really effective in these sort of situations, especially, you know, this is a, a, a commercial lake with lots of different people fishing it. The fish are very pressured um, and often a running rig can snare fish that a semi-fixed rig will not. And um, I've got running leg clips on. I've basically just squeezed the eye that goes inside the leg clip um, just a little tiny bit so that there's hardly any purchase inside the leg clip. You can just about pick it up out of your hand and then it, and then it falls off the swivel. Um, and it turns it into a running rig. And um, you know, it doesn't stop you getting proper takes. I've had absolutely blistering runs here uh, when I've been fishing in open water. Um, but it just means that the fish have got no anchor point. So when they pick up the rig, they detect something's wrong, they shake their head. Sometimes with a semi-fixed rig, they can use the weight of the lead to shake the hook out. So um, fishing the running rig with tubing on it so that it's very anti-tangle um, is my number one choice. And coupled with that, I've had various hook links on and um, probably the most overall successful has just been, the, you know, your good old faithful combi rig. And I do that in two different ways. One is with the 25 pound boom material, I crimp a big loop at one end that goes onto my quick change swivel that fits inside the leg clip. Um, and I, I crimp a very small loop at the other end. Um, Crimping is very, very easy to do if you've not done it. Um, just follow the guidelines on the back of the packet. They're double barrel crimps. You go through one, make the little loop through the other uh, and literally just line up the two barrels in the jaws of the crimp tool and squeeze it down and it, and it just compresses the whole thing. If you flatten it completely, you've done it wrong. 
and um, you want to be testing it really to destruction before you put it out there. If you've done it wrong, it will slip quite easily. If you've done it right, it shouldn't, it shouldn't go at all. It's very, very strong. And then at the end of that, I've got like a loop system. So I double over a bit of 30 pound armor cord, which is quite a stiff braided material. And I use that on purpose so that it throws the hook out. If you use stuff that's very soft, like Supernatural, I've tested it in the edge a lot, and you've got the real, real stiffness of the boom, pushes it all out away from the lead. And what happens generally is the hook bait comes back on itself and falls back on top of the hook link if you use a really soft material, like Supernatural. Um, so I've used the armor cord because it's got that stiffness to it. It is floating, but it's only an inch long, so it doesn't make a jot's worth of difference. Um, and that pushes out straight every single time. And the, the only critical aspect of a combi rig, in my opinion, is that there is a difference between the two materials. Um, it's called a combi rig because it's a combination of materials. So as long as the bit at the end near the hook is softer than the boom section, it doesn't matter how soft it is. So the boom here is very, very stiff and that material just works brilliantly with it. So I basically double it over, do my favorite whipping knot, but you only have to do three turns around the hook before you pull it tight because that gives you six wraps of material because it's doubled up. You end up with two hairs sticking out the top of it. I cut one of those off and just pick the one that's dead center of the back of the hook. And then I do the same whipping knot again, further up the hook to hold the hair in place. I'll do that instead of using the rig ring. Um, and then I've normally got probably a five mil gap if I'm using a wafter, and that's what I've fished with generally. I started off with the garlic wafters. They were um, the salty squid um, wafters in the high impact range, I believe, from Mainline. Uh, they start off pink, put the garlic supreme all over them, and they go a lovely orangey color. And I've done well on that combination absolutely everywhere. So that's what I started with. Um, and then since the session's gone on a little bit and I've fed lots and lots of boilie, I've moved on to a link wafter, um, again, straight out of the mainline range, and I've just soaked that in a little bit of squid goo. Um, and uh, that seems to complement that really, really well. So, um, so with the wafters, I only want a short hair. So basically the bait's not sticking up off the bottom a long way. If I was gonna fish with a bottom bait, or maybe a bottom bait tipped with a bit of plastic corn, I'd have a bit of a longer hair so that the hook can lay flat on the bottom and the bait can sit away from it and not roll the hook around on the lake bed. Um, so that's what I've got most of my bites on. I have swapped over later in, in the session. I did get one tangle on that, that combi rig with a boom. Um, and I think maybe it's because I had such a heavy hook bait on. That was one of the days when I fished a snowman with a 20 miller and uh, a 10 miller on top. Um, so I changed over to hybrid stiff straight through and I crimp that onto um, a size eight ring swivel rather than a quick change swivel because it just helps it all rotate in the air that bit better. And Daryl uses that system all the time with lead clips um, and he gets virtually no tangles no matter what material he uses. So I've gone over to that and I'm pl pleased to say since that I've not had a single tangle. You are casting in the dark a lot of the time here, you know, because, um, you know, if you, if you get what feels like maybe an aborted take or, or it's a line or something and you're not happy and you want to reposition it, you've got to do it in the dark because, you know, we've got getting on for sort of 12 to 14 hours of darkness now and all the bites are happening in the dark. So you need something that you're confident is going to be perfect every single time. And that hybrid stiff with a little bit stripped back by the hook, with that one I'm using a claw hook. Um, which is a new pattern that I've been developing for quite a long time. Very, very heavily interned eye, quite a long shank um, and an intern point. And um, you know, the, the, uh, the ones that I've connected with have been absolutely nailed on that setup. So that's the sort of main one. The other one that I've used um, out in more in open water um, is again the boom, but it's boom straight through, a little loop at the other end um, instead of having the, you know, the, uh, the bit of braid. Um, and on that loop is, is crimped one of the, the new spinner swivels, um, but the PTFE ones, and they really rotate really quickly. And onto that, I've got a size two curve, covered up with one of the D-rig kickers to um, cover up the join between the swivel and the hook. And then you've got that lovely D-rig system, again with an 18mm link wafter on it. Um, and the fish I had on that was absolutely nailed. So um, I'm using the wafters in this situation because I'm putting a lot of boilie out. It's late in the season, you know, these are big fish. Um, I reckon they've been fished for with bright hook baits um, over and over and over again. And I wanted something that was, 
you know, stand out from the rest of it because it's got that girl on it as well, um, but it wasn't too obvious. Um, and uh, I think if you're going to fish at this time of the year, you know, when the fish are eating bait, um, I don't think you can go far wrong with a wafter if it's presentable. I would definitely go over to a pop-up, my favourite spinner rig, you know, with uh, a probably either a, a wide gape X and a little pop-up, little sort of 14 mil pop-up and a size 4 hook or a size 4 curve if you want a straight pointed one. Um, you know, both of those I think are a brilliant combination. Normally I'd fish that on a helicopter rig rather than a lead clip if there's a bit of chod on the bottom, a bit of weed, dying weed and you know, uh, little bits of leaf and that sort of stuff. Um, but in situations like this where it's super clear, um, it's really nice to fish a wafter. I gave the daytime swim another go with a change to match the hatch hook baits as the higher tracks hadn't produced a bite the day before, in spite of fish showing right over the spot. This time I got that elusive afternoon bite just as the light was fading, but sadly it got in the snags. With time running out, I put the loss to the back of my mind and focused on getting the rods out for the night. On making contact with this fish, it instantly felt heavy, but what really convinced me that it was a big one was how slow and purposeful each run was. To start with, the fight took place on the left-hand side of the swim, but suddenly the fish charged right. Luckily, the other line was well sunk and the fish passed easily over the top. All that was left to do was keep calm and coax this unseen beast towards the weight in there. It definitely had size. This mega long common was a serious, serious fish. Whoa. Well, how's about that? 53 pound common, and uh, yesterday I said um, I'm going to put lots of bait out and fish pop ups over the top. And the, um, the thinking behind that was to try and generate a multiple catch situation you know, get fish on the spot, catch one quickly because I've seen the pop ups, and then be able to recast and uh, capitalise on that situation. But it hasn't happened, you know, just one single take and uh, all I can say is lots of bait and pop-ups over the top is also a big fish tactic and uh, here is the proof of that. Lovely. Well, what a result that was, you know. Um, you know there's loads of big fish out there, you can hear them jumping in the night, but to, to finally catch one. They look absolutely enormous for their size. You know, they're not very um, wide fish. They're long and they're deep, but they're not very wide. So they look even bigger than they really are. You know, 53 pounds on the bank, it looked like a 60 all day long. So um, yeah, over the moon to have caught it and uh, looking forward to the days ahead. The plan to put lots of bait out hasn't generated multiple hits, but what it has done it has sort of helped me catch a big fish. There wasn't much bait in the sling, so I don't know how much of the bait that he ate before he ended up on the um, on the hook as such. But I reckon I reckon a lot of that bait's still out there. I can't believe that my two pop-ups are sat over all that bait and I've only had one take. I, I can't, I don't believe that's happened. I believe a lot of that bait's still out there. Um, I'm gonna top up, but I'm not gonna put as much out. I'll probably put, I don't know, maybe a couple of kilos. I'm gonna go in with a mixture of 15 mil cell in smart liquid, few tiger nuts and a little bit of maize and uh, I'm going to continue with the white pop-ups over the top. I'd managed to land a common in the night too, albeit much smaller than Daryl's, but very welcome all the same. There we go, 26 pound fighting machine, look at the length of the thing. 
No wonder it led me such a merry dance last night. And we're going to have a change of tactics for that left-hand rod down the margin. It's a very, very consistent area, obviously because it's closest to the outer bounds. Um, but I'm going to put a straight pointed hook on tonight because I keep getting aborted takes on that rod. The fish are just shaking it out and I think they're very, very spooky of that area. There's a sign that says no fishing beyond this point. I reckon everyone fishes up to that sign and the fish know all about it. So loads more link boily, still a little combi rig uh, with a flat lead, um, but this time a long shank X and see if we can nail them a little bit faster. I'm using a fish mill that I'm working on with Mainline. Um, I've been using it for the last two summers and if I was carrying on a campaign into the autumn, I would definitely carry on using it. And really you want to let the fish's reaction um, tell you when to change baits. So this time of year, water's still well above 10 degrees, you know, so the attraction in those baits is not locked inside it. And the problem with those kind of baits in real low temperatures, if there's any oil in the bait, then that congeals and it locks the attraction inside the bait. So certainly now, fishing with it with something like Smart Liquid over the top of it, it's still a brilliant time of year. And if you've conditioned the fish into eating it over the whole summer, then you want to carry on you know that's a real important thing when you're baiting that consistency you know same bait going in over and over again you can definitely train the carp into looking for your boilies so the time i'd start to change really would be when the water really is dropping sort of end of november into december and what i would do before that is i'd mix the bait i'm currently using the, the summer and autumn bait with what I'm going to use in the winter. So in this case, it'd be fibre, another prototype bait um, that I've been working on with Mainline for the past few winters. Um, completely different makeup of bait, much higher carbohydrate, lower protein, very fibrous, as the name would suggest. The water gets into it really quickly. It's got corn steep liquor in it, which is a really good winter attractor and also a really good toffee flavour um, that Mainline make themselves, um, which has got a, tr a proven winter track record. So that will be my winter bait. And if I was going from on somewhere from summer, autumn into winter, then I would mix the two together, probably starting now and give the fish a taste for the other bait as well. Um, and then you're just conditioning them into looking for that food. As the water gets colder and you stop using your fish meal, um, you've already got the fish into the other bait that you're going to be using right the way through. And the same in the springtime, you know, if you're going to carry on on the same water, then start to introduce the summer bait in the springtime when you're still using the winter bait and then change over gradually rather than just one to the other. If I was coming onto a new lake at this time of the year, I would definitely go with something tried and tested. And that's exactly why we've brought the cell and the link with us here. We've used both those baits um, for a number of years now, particularly cell. You know, it's been out a long time, caught a lot of carp, and you'll never go far wrong if you start with that at any time of the year. But the nice thing with cell is you can fish it on right into the winter and it will carry on working. We found here that the link actually has been the one that we've seen in the slings more and um, you know that's something really to pay attention to um, not just for your own captures but other people's as well um, if you're seeing a certain bait in the sling then um, they're definitely tuned into that bait so having a mix of two has established that for us pretty quickly and i've swapped more of my mix over now to link still got a few tigers in there because there are bream in here so i didn't want to put lots of corn in or maize or anything because it can bring the bream in and at this time of the year, the fish's requirement for protein is going down. Scientific studies have proved that the fish need a lot less protein in the winter time than they do in the summer. If you want to give them loads of bait, do it after they've spawned. Do it in the summertime, that's when they're really troughing. And I think a lot of people can make mistakes at this time of the year by putting too much in. So as I say, stick with what works. Use something you've got confidence in if it's their first time on a new lake, but definitely pay attention to what other people are catching on. That's on. Daytime bite. 
absolutely amazed. You see the back lead there up at the top. Um, slid a back lead on this morning. I like to do that in the in the daylight because we're in fairly deep water. This uh, this new low stretch line is super super clear. Uh, you can see when it gets wet, you can you can see the spool underneath the line. It's that clear. Not easy for the fish to see, but still, they're in so, such close proximity to it. I like to try and keep it a little bit on the deck or closer to the deck. And uh, with it not being weedy here because of the time of year, I guess, um, you can get away with a back lead. After the fish I had last night, that 24 pound common, we don't have to go this one. Um, Put out probably another kilo, kilo and a half. It feels like a lot when you're throwing it in by hand. It feels like a lot. Um, but I think the fish are really switched on to it now. They really like this link. And uh, they're showing down in that corner almost constantly. Fished up the other end for two days, trying to get a bite in the day. <laughs> I could have stayed here. Quite thick. <sighs> if I can catch you unaware, mate, I can get in that net. Yes, get in. Oh, that is wicked, man. Nice to get one in the daytime. Proper angry one. All fins and attitude, this guy. 26 and a half pounds. And he's definitely, definitely a male. You can see big fins, big fit wrist to the tail. Um, definitely a boy, this one. And the plan for today, once this one goes back, is to carry on fishing this swim right the way through the day. Get everything sorted really early. Um, I've done some fishing up the other end the last couple of days, which only resulted in one lost fish. Um, right at the death, um, I fished right up to the snags and it got in the snags unfortunately. Um, and that's because I thought this swim wouldn't do bites in the day and this fish has proved me utterly wrong. To get a bite at midday out of the blue is a real surprise. So um, the last couple of days of the session I'm going to fish all day on both spots. Um, but I'm going to get sorted really early which I've not done for the last few days as I've been rushing down here as it's been getting dark. So hopefully um, we might get a bite in the afternoon or one earlier in the night. So, um, yeah, we're definitely learning more about the lake as every day goes on. I've got a pair of absolutely battered Daiwa Bayesia Customs there. Um, they actually don't make these anymore, but they're, they're exactly the same reel as the, um, the QDXs and the QDs. Um, and I'm probably due a new set. These are all rat eaten and yeah, they've seen, they've seen a lot of miles, you know, I do a lot of fishing. But they're my, I would not change. You know, that is the style of reel that I will, when I upgrade, I will keep to that style, you know, probably QDXs again. Um, they're my favourite. I've been using them ever since, I think 2008 when I was fishing at Collingbrook, I've been using that style of Bayesia. And uh, I love the clutch. I love how lightweight they are. They're just a dream to use. So yeah, really nice bit of kit. Um, my bank stick setup is the, the black singles. Um, been out a few years, ultra light, really tarty. You know, they look, they look the part, you know, not keeping the rods nice and close together. The spacing's exactly the same, and uh, they are rock solid. If you get them in the ground properly, they are rock solid, especially with a stabiliser. Um, bite alarms, I'm using the TXIDs or TXDs, I think they're called now. Um, they're the new Delkims, improved range, digital design, and uh, not had them too long, but I had no bother with them. Really like them, a little bit smaller than the originals and loads and loads of settings on there that you can mess around with. I try to keep it pretty simple, you know, but if you want to get right into it, there's loads of different settings on them. Um, probably the thing that's making the most difference to the fishing would be the line. You know, uh, the line is a minefield these days and they all, people often say, what's the best line? And the truth is different lines suit different situations. But where I can, I really like to use fluorocarbon. I use the 12 pound contour. I've not used the other the other braking strains, but the 12 pound, I've used it a lot at Welly. I'm obviously using it here. And uh, the key things that I like most about it is 
it can be a little bit coily when you first get it off the reel, but I walked it down the path. I wrapped up to my um, marks. I knew how far out I was fishing. I walked down the path longer than that, give the line a, a really good stretch. And fluorocarbon, although it does stretch back a little bit, it sort of stays a little, it stays stretched a bit, you know, so you've taken some of the stretch out of it by giving it a good pull. And what that does, it makes it really responsive for feeling the lead down. So that's one of the, the key things that I really like about it. it feel, you can feel the lead down, but it, better than any mono. You know, there's, there's some monos that are less stretchy than others, but fluorocarbon it has got a lot less stretch than mono. And it, it's sort of somewhere between mono and braid, you know, it's in the middle and it is really good. Um, but the other thing that fluorocarbon has over monofilament is that it's really heavy you know maybe five times heavier you know and when you when you start paying line off at the reel like i have been here it is literally you can just see it whoosh, tightening back up whoosh, tightening back up and that's it's just going down and down and being able to keep that on the bottom out the way of the fish you know that, that that's a major edge you know a major major edge being able to feel the lead down get a really crisp crisp transmission through the line get being able to sink it right out of the way so it's sort of making the fish feel comfortable in the swim and on top of that it's also i would say in my opinion more um abrasion resistant than most lines it's harder to touch um and i've never had any bother you know people do use the 15 they do use the 18 but i find the 12 more user friendly you know if you want to cast it you know i, I fish at wellington quite a lot uh, what well, i have been this year and we're fishing up to 30 wraps with it and i can fish 26 27 28 with a flick you know i'm not even putting much into it so in that diameter 0.33 ultra strong and ultra responsive for feeling the lead down so really really nice and uh, that's my hardware for this session even though i just had a 50 pound common i wasn't happy with just one bite each night there was enough fish showing along the far bank to warrant moving one of the rods i just had to be careful not to cut off the one that produced the first two fish I felt like a change of loose feed might get a different reaction. I kept the boily and tiger approach on the productive spot, but on the spot on the far margin, I decided to fish with six kilos of straight maize. Jürgen said lots of anglers use it, so they're able to bait up heavier for a lot less money. Hopefully the fish could be enticed to feeding harder on this. With so much bait in a tight area, the yellow isotonic pop-up would hopefully give me a much better chance of a quick bite. If you're going to find the fish quickly in autumn, now is the time to start looking. Um, complete contrast to the spring and the summer when you want to be there at first light if you can. And certainly you want to be up at first light mid-session um, looking for fish. But autumn and into winter, last light seems to be a much better time to see them uh, than first light does. But know why that is, maybe, uh, you know, it's... Uh, the warmest part of the day has just subsided, the light level's going down, it turns them on and they want to show. Um, but whatever the reason is, it happens on almost every lake. I can think of a few where they did, still do show first thing in the morning and often they're very deep lakes. Um, I know one of the uh, embryo lakes at Crown Country Park, they still show their first thing in the morning right the way through the autumn and that's when bite time is as well. But generally, in the autumn, bite time is late in the afternoon but going into the early part of the evening and we've really found that on this particular lake um, that most of the bites have come before one o'clock in the morning and a lot of them sort of 9, 10, 11 o'clock um, so if you're day fishing and you can stay till that sort of time um, then, um, then definitely do at this time of the year. Um, there's, there's one just shown just sort of I don't know if it was a carp or not, just out in open water there. But, you know, this is the time that you want to be standing at the front of your swim looking. Um, and uh, it's a toughie because you might have been set up already, gone on a hunch, gone on what's happened before, what somebody else has seen. You know, if they've seen fish there the night before, the evening before, that's a really good place to start. Um, if it's from seasons gone by, then you've got to go on something because you can sit there all day looking and not see a thing and then it comes to this sort of time and the lake just comes alive. And if you don't know the, the spots in the swims where they're showing, you don't know whether there's weed there or whatever, it can be very problematic. And sometimes just slinging pop-ups at them, um, as long as you get some sort of drop, 
you know, at least you're in the zone where the fish are. And then just spraying a little bit of bait over the top, throwing, sticking or catapulting in the dark so the seagulls don't get it is a good ploy. You, know, you don't want to be crashing tons and tons of spawns in or marker floats or anything if you absolutely don't have to. So um, that sort of approach. And if you get a bite on that spot, then uh, you know you should know roughly how many wraps it was to the area. Make a note of that. Have a cast around the next day and just see what really is out there. And then you've got a spot logged in the memory banks for next time. Um, but certainly, you know, if you've if you've got there during the day and already set up, you know, be scanning the water now and into darkness. You know, the longer you can stay up in the evening. Often it's like you get dark for a couple of hours and they'll start. You know, seven, eight, nine o'clock. Boom, boom, you'll hear one. Boom, boom, you'll hear, hear another one. You know, in them situations, if you're not on them, you know, then I would wind in and get round to where they are and just fling hook baits out over the top of them. So that's my tips for autumn location. Obviously, every lake is different. There are no rules. It's probably the biggest rule in carp fishing. But if you want a starting point, dusk is it. The first bite came well before midnight, and this was off of the maze spot. With two rods split on two different areas, this had to mean there was more than one take to be had tonight. Sure enough, both spots produced two takes each, and I got very little sleep. Not that I was overly worried. When the feeding spells are at night, you have to fish through the tiredness and make the most of it. This was my first bite during daylight. Proof enough that having two spots was key to getting multiple takes. I hadn't put any more bait in on this occasion. The initial big hit's enough to keep the bites coming without spawning in the dark. A valuable lesson learned for the night ahead. One, two, three, four. I think that's what you call an autumn masterclass. The isotonic and bonoffies were working a treat, and I was convinced the pop-ups over the tight baiting was the key to snaring quicker bites. Well, how's about that? Four fish in the night, two on each rod, with this one and at 36 pounds he is absolutely lovely and uh, it's certainly working now. So with regard to rigs in autumn truth be told I don't change my rigs due to the seasons change you know they get changed to do with the bottom that I'm fishing over and the bait that I want to fish so rigs are always designed around the hook baits the loose feed that you're fishing and the, the makeup of the bottom as such. So at the start of this session, I decided to use what I call the, um, the Combi Multi Rig. Um, it's a rig that I've done really well at home on. It's basically just a Combi Rig, but it allows you to quick change the hook. And that's a big thing for me. You know, I've been using spinner rigs in recent years and I've sort of fallen in love with that, that quick change ability, being able to change the, the, when you use sharpened hooks like I do, being able to change that is, it makes all the difference if you haven't got to keep re reconstructing rigs every time you catch one or you, or you burr a hook. So I'll talk to you a little bit about how I construct that combi multi-rig. So the first part of it is, is basically creating the loop that it allows you to quick change the, the hook as such. So it involves a doubled over piece of, um, it's the inner braid from the dark matter coated braid. And you might wonder why I'm using the inner braid from, from dark matter and not uh, say supernatural or another braid. And the reason is it's a little bit stiffer and it's a little bit more coarse than most of the other sort of braided hook links that you can get. And uh, because it's stiffer, it, it's a little bit more anti-tangle. And because it's a little bit more coarse, it requires less turns on the Albright knot, um, which is, it just makes it a little bit neater. So the first thing to do is to fold over a length of boom. I'm using the 25 pound and uh, just fold it over, leave yourself a couple of inches tag, and then I'll thread a piece of maybe four to five inches of doubled over dark matter coated braid, just the inner of that, like I said, and I take it so it's two and a half centimeters through the loop. So there's a two and a half centimeter piece of braid coming out of the folded over piece of boom. And then I use the tag end, it's a doubled over piece of braid at this point, and that goes around both sections of the boom four times effectively it's eight times because you're using a doubled over piece of line and then they go back through the beginning loop of the boom so that both pieces you know both tag ends and the loop they are exiting the same direction that's really important so you get them to come both out of the way and when you pull that tight with a, a puller tool if you've got it two and a half centimeters to start with by the time that knot beds down slips tight it's going to be three and a half centimeters so that is what you're aiming for a three and a half centimetre loop 
which allows you to quick change bait. And the boom itself is about, I would say five, five and a half inches long. And one thing to bear in mind with boom is it when you stretch it on the puller tools, it stays stretched. So if you want five and a half, you're gonna start at five. And um, I crimp mine to a hybrid leg clip. Um, really easy to do, really neat, really sort of minimal. I, I, you can not boom, but I just think it's really nice to use that crimp, crimp it down, it's really strong. Give it a good old pull with a pull of tools, put it across the steam, and that is ready to go. You know, that, that, that hook link can last you as many fish, you know, like you can, I've caught loads and loads of fish on the same rig, but being able to change the hook is the key benefit of that rig. From here, I put a, a piece of um, silicon on. I like to use a 0.7 mil, um, roughly, I would say 10 to 12 mil in length. You thread that down the braided section and I use that to just cover over the knot. It keeps all the tags all flush and uh, it also stops the, the back end of the, um, the, like the secondary piece of boom sticking out the back, keeps that all covered over so it's nice and neat. It looks like a piece of putty but it's a piece of silicon. I'm not using it as a, as a counterbalance weight, it's just, a, just to neaten it up. So after the silicon, I like to add a, a small 12 mil piece of the medium shrink tube. I'm using green and I like to align align that um, and the reason I do that is sort of an old school edge for getting the hook to flip over. So you take a, a splicer needle, you go through the, the big hole on the shrink tube, you come out through the little hole that you've made with the baiting needle and you draw the loop through. From there you use your loop to thread through the eye of a size six wide gape. I'm using the wide gape X's for my wafters and I go through the, uh, the front side of the eye. That hook then slides up into the shrink tube and you put a, a micro hook ring swivel onto that loop and then you pass the loop over the hook point and draw it up so that the base of this loop is up against, well, roughly opposite the barb and you make sure that the hole on the line line section of the shrink tube is facing down towards the point. And effectively, that is the rig finished. Obviously, you have to steam it, steam it straight, steam the shrink tube tight, and then it's just a case of threading your bait onto, the, uh, onto a piece of um, on bait floss, onto that micro ring swivel, and there you go. So I started on the, on the combi multi-rig as, as such, but um, once I started applying a bit more bait to the swim, I was concerned a bit being, becoming a bit of a, a needle in a haystack situation, you know, fishing a wafter in amongst loads of bait. They'd have to eat a good proportion of it to, to come, across, come across the rig as such. So the idea was to introduce some bait and then fish bright white pop-ups over the top um, to try and get that quick take so that I could hopefully benefit, you know, have a few fish feeding on the spot, catch one quite quickly and be able to recast. Um, and for that, I decided to use a spinner rig, obviously, now in 2021, as you'll probably see in this, it's nothing new. You know, the spinner rig's been out a very long time, but what it is, it's an ultra efficient way to fish pop-ups and, you know, some, some things that are really good are timeless. So um, I'm fishing it on a, on a helicopter system. And I think when you're fishing with a, a stiff boom, like um, rig, you know, it sort of, it allows for the, for better presentation even on hard bottom you know because you could be it could be a stone on the bottom with an inline or a leg clip presentation there is a risk of the um the boom part of the rig sticking up of the bottom so i prefer to fish it on a helicopter fished on leg core and i fish that three to three and a half feet long um, and i fish the top bead when it's clear bottom like it is here i fish it pretty close you know four to five inches away from the lead so moving on to the the actual spinner rig itself um, I use hybrid stiff, um, it only comes in 20 pound and as far as I'm aware it's the only coated braid which is crimpable, you know there's, I don't even know if crimpable is a word but it's the only coated braid that you can crimp um, because a lot of them you'll find that the, the core will pull through so I use 20 pound hybrid and I crimp it to um, a size 11 ring swivel and I'm fishing that between the ring swivel and the spinner swivel I would say that's five to five and a half inches long, so roughly that sort of length. And I also put, I know a lot of people would just, um, use anti-tangle sleeves, but I prefer to use shrink tube because it's a, a permanent fixture and it hasn't got to be put back on and, and taken on and off, you know, it's, it's a permanent fixture. I like to use shrink tube, I find it a little bit more minimal and it does exactly the same job. So I'm using a three and a half piece of shrink tube at the, the ring swivel end and I've got a little loop going onto uh, a, a spinner swivel but without the, without the ring. I just like uh, the loop left in the, 
hybrid stiff and a little bit of putty moulded around that crimp. It's just ultra neat. I like neat things. Um, and the hook, I use a size 4 wide gape X. You know, a lot of people use curved shanks. A lot of people use cranks. It works with various di different patterns, but the wide gape X is my preferred pattern. And I'm sharpening it down to an ultra fine point, passing over a micro ring hook ring swivel over the hook. Then I've got a tiny hook bead. That's positioned just opposite the barb or just slightly higher than the barb. And then on the eye of the hook, I force over a large kicker. I trim down the fatter end to take about two to three mil off the fatter end. And I slide it thin end first onto the eye of the hook. I then clip it onto the, the spinner swivel, pull it back over, making sure that it's the correct way around. You're using the, the kink in the kicker to angle the hook over. And it's just, like I say, the spinner rig's been out a really long time now, but it's an ultra efficient way to fish pop-ups and it's very, very versatile. Good in that net. Yes, get in. Nice. No good now, mate. You caught. Gotcha. Yeah, man. Look at that. Absolute pristine common. 28 and a half pounds. And that spot behind me is producing the takes like clockwork now. 10 o'clock in the morning. Doesn't matter what's happened the night before, I get a bite. And when you fish a lake over and over, you can build up a picture of what spots are doing bites at what times of the day. And providing you get the rods out there a few hours before bite time, you know, you can really make the most of the swim. Nothing's happening in open water during the day, but this spot is still rocking. And I'm pleased I've got it at my disposal. Oh, look at the mouth on it, look. Yeah, man, awesome. So here in Germany, we're allowed to use a boat and uh, it's actually compulsory to have one in the swim. You know, if you get a fish snagged up or it gets in some weed, then you can go out in the boat and, and try and free it. So obviously we've got it here for that. You're allowed to put your rigs out. You're allowed to put, um, not to go, allowed to go out and bait up. Um, I've only used it for baiting up. And I think it's, if you're gonna be putting a lot of bait out like I was, you know, you could be doing the spawn, you know, clack, clack, clack and you're putting disturbance into your swim for as long as it takes to get the amount of bait out that you want. So if you wanted to put out 10 kilos, eight kilos, you could be doing it for several hours and really disrupting your swim, or cast your marker float out to your spot, nip out in the um, inflatable, throw the bait around the marker float, get it exactly where you want it, nice and accurate, and then come back to the bank and cast. And that's exactly what I've done. You know, I like to fish like that if I can. If I can bait up from the boat and cast from the bank, I'm, I'm really, really happy. So. A couple of things worth mentioning with regard to safety when you're using a boat is, first of all, use a life jacket or a flotation vest. And uh, secondly, if it's windy, you know, on a really windy day, it's definitely much safer to stay sitting down. You'd have seen that I was standing up throughout the session, but it's been pretty calm. And uh, in that situation, it's okay. But on, a, on a really windy day, it does pay. Keep your center of gravity nice and low. And you've got much less chance of falling out. I'm constantly trying to get as many bites from every 24 hour period as humanly possible and on a longer session small changes to the position of the rig can make a big difference. This is the earliest bite I've had, well I've not had a bite in daylight hours in the afternoon and um, this is after the recasting and well rebaited first after the 28 this morning and a little bit of a sneaky thing I thought because I've been fishing this same spot over and over I'll fish half a rod length further and I'll bait half a rod length shorter so that my rig is pretty much past my bait in the hope that I would get a quicker bite as the fish come out of that sanctuary they're going to hit my rig before they hit the the main bed of bait and it has worked 
is a mirror, I think. Whoa. Getting there, oh, yes. Oh, touch, 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 touch. Have a look at you. Oh. Come on, big guy. Up you come. Yeah, man. Thirty pounds, twelve ounces. Absolutely pulled me arm off, and uh, so pleased that that tactic works and got me an early bite. I'm definitely going to repeat that process tonight. Half rod length or so past the bait, see if I can get quicker bites. And uh, the other rod should spark up as well, you know. It's been out there four nights now without a take. So what I've done, I've not replaced the rig or any bait today. I've left it all out there from yesterday. It was all sweet, so it can just sit out there. Hopefully that will produce something. But if this rod keeps doing it like this, I'll still be happy. The 10 o'clock bite never came, so at midday I redid that rod and moved the second one down to this area with a completely new rig on. I'd seen Daryl have so many on pop-ups, I decided to give one a go. A 14mm link pop-up was cast next to the wafter. Both rigs now rod length past the bait to test one against the other. And at six o'clock, completely out of the blue, the wafter rod was away again. What's driving at this fish? This was the only fish that had kept trying to do me in the marginal tree line. Each time it headed for the branches, I eased right off on the pressure, and each time the fish stopped pulling and turned back out into open water. This happened time after time until I had it right under the rod tip. It's a ballsy move when a fish is heading for snags, but it often tricks them into not pulling back, and then you can carefully lead them away from danger and into netting range. Get in that net. Yes, get in. Oh, that's the biggest one so far. 100%. Yeah, man. <laughs> yes. Oh, not crying. Just got fat in the eye. Okay. This is it my first 40 pound up from this lake. Yes, just about 40 pounds, four ounces. Yes, get in. Oh, yes. Yeah, man, look at that. 40 pounds, four ounces. Absolutely chuffed to bits with this one. And uh, after losing one last night on the same rig, Oh, absolutely gutted. Nothing happened after that. And uh, I just put the same rig out again, just an inch longer. And this one was absolutely nailed. And what a battle as well. I'm absolutely over the moon. Mwah. Thank you, my darling. Look at that. Yes. It was our final night and expectations were high, but the temperature was plummeting. A new weather system can bring in cold air and the temperature can drop 10 degrees from the night before. This can be the kiss of death on a shallow lake, but deeper lakes take far longer to cool, especially down on the lake bed. That's why they're such a great choice as autumn turns to winter. Bloody freezing, man. That's better. <laughs> Here we 
go. Mush. Like that. It's in there. The spinner rig with the isotonic pop-up had absolutely nailed this one, and the scale spun. 51, 12, 51 and a half. Result. After the success that I'd had the night before, I rebated both spots but with much less bait. Often the anglers go big on the last night and put far too much bait in. I'm sure if I'd have done the same, I wouldn't have caught this amazing old character. Well, here he is, 51 pounds of German mirror and the perfect end to the Autumn Masterclass. Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope you've learned loads along the way and thanks for watching. There we go. <laughs>